Hi everyone and welcome back to another episode of Damn Canada by me, Dee Dee. If you are new here, hi, hello, and welcome. It is great to have you. Here on Damn Canada, I like to cover all the lesser known murder mystery. What? Here on Damn Canada, I like to cover all the lesser known murder mystery and mayhem cases that go on here in Canada and Canada only. So if that's something that you're interested in, I hope I see you around. Today's video is coming with a very strong trigger warning. I cannot stress that enough. This case today is extremely heavy. I will be covering a wide range of extremely disturbing and triggering topics, including but not limited to murder, torture, kidnapping, essays and more so if you are someone that struggles with any of those topics or if you're someone that struggles with just those extremely disturbing videos maybe skip out on this one and if you are new here and this is the first video i do i promise you that not all of my videos are this disturbing the way I'm going to tell this case today, I'm going to split it up into two parts. So this will be part one of a two-parter, my very first two-parter type of thing. There is a lot to this case. And so, and so for us to get the full effect of what really went on, this video will be covering the point of view of the victims as things went on over time, as well as like surrounding people, the community and such. And the second part or part two of this case will be covering the point of view of the um, culprit of everything that goes on and everything that we know now since everything has come to light and all the court proceedings have happened and everything like that. I hope that makes sense. Now, I won't be doing two-parter videos and stuff like that very often. The only reason I felt it was necessary to do for this video or for this case is because I don't want to disrespect the victims by focusing just on the um, culprit of everything and you'll understand what I mean once we go through the whole case. But I just personally feel that if I told it all in one big story, the insanity of what goes on could easily, the victims could easily be lost in all of that. And I don't want their names to be forgotten. So strap yourselves in and get your security blanket because this case is anybody's worst nightmare. Approximately 10 years after the horrible acts of Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka were revealed to the world and shocked all of Canada, a new horrible sadist was on the rise. Since the beginning of 2007, reports of burglaries where women's lingerie, bras, and underwear were being stolen were slowly starting to come in from Tweed, Belleville, and Ottawa, which are all located in Ontario, Canada. In each area, the burglaries were always coming in from pretty much the same neighborhoods. It seemed whoever was doing this liked to go to those specific areas. Late in 2007, there were a string of break-ins in the cozy cottage town of Tweed. One female was coming home from a party when she entered into her home and was surprised to see a, a tall, dark figure in jogging gear in her home. The intruder ran through the home and out the back door, through the backyard, hopped the fence, and disappeared into the bushes behind the house. She called her dad, who lived nearby, along with the police. There didn't seem to be anything stolen, and so they thought maybe it was just some neighborhood kids screwing around. But then things slowly started to escalate. In January of 2009, in the Ottawa suburb Orleans, a family returned from vacation and pulled into their driveway. They got out of their vehicle and started grabbing their things to bring inside. Their younger daughter, who was 15 years old, entered into her house and like most teenagers do, ran straight up to her bedroom. She unzipped her suitcase and turned to open her top drawer to put her things away. Her parents were downstairs when the teenager came running down the stairs, freaking out. All my underwear are gone. She screamed at her parents. At the sound of this statement, her parents kind of laughed it off. Did you check the floor or laundry? They asked, not taking her seriously. But when she replied back, visibly shaken, no, I'm serious, there's nothing in my drawer. That's when their hearts sunk into their stomachs. They went back to her room to assess the situation and that's when they noticed a lot more 
was taken than just her underwear. Along with the entire underwear drawer, bikinis, dresses, shoes, and photographs of the teenager were also missing. The intruder also went through the family photo albums and took the photos that included the 15 year old. When the police did their investigation, they did find and collect DNA evidence and the family was told to thoroughly clean everything. It's, it's disgusting. The 15 year old wasn't able to sleep in her bedroom for at least three months. And on top of that, her family took every proper precaution to make sure their daughter was safe. She wasn't left alone for months. Of course, the neighborhood heard of what had happened and some were starting to get pretty worried about what was all going on. It started to seem like the random break-ins were starting to escalate in a very perverted way. Over the months, there's over 30 break-ins reported to the police with women's intimates being stolen. Hundreds of pairs, just to give you a good example of the type of obsession that we're dealing with. The Ottawa police warned the residents to be vigilant as this was a very peculiar type of burglary, along with it all being in the same suburb, the Orleans suburb of Ottawa. On September 17th of 2009, in Tweed, a mother was resting in her bed near her eight-week-old baby when around 1 a.m. a tall dark figure broke into her home and her nightmare began. She was woken by being slapped on the left side of her face by the intruder. She tried to get away from him, but he was so large that he just overpowered her with his body weight alone. The intruder then attempted to tie her up with the baby's nursing blanket, but when it wasn't long enough, he used something else. After she was tied up, the man took a knife and cut her clothes off her body. He took out a Sony camera and proceeded to take photos of her. He went on to sexually assault her and continuously took photos of the incident till he left around 3 a.m., making sure to take some of her underwear with him as he left. She called the police when she was sure he was gone, and with this call coming in, the police started to get worried. The incidents were escalating. The next night, the intruder actually came back to the house. Although this time, the young woman wasn't attacked or even aware that he was in the house this time. He just came to steal more underwear. A BE and e resulting in a sexual assault is alarming enough, but to have the culprit return is just next level. A week later, the young woman was shaken to her core to find that there had been a third break in into the home where she was already violated in throwing any ounce of security she might have felt right out the window the public was not made aware of this assault at the time i believe that was due to the um, victim's request we don't know her name there is a publication ban on it so you will not be able to find it and so because of um them not knowing about the incident the community actually didn't know that the incidents were escalating to this degree more break-ins occurred during the last week of September in the Cozy Cove area of Tweed, with another one turning sadistic. At around 1 a.m. on September 30th, 2009, a lady named Lori was at home by herself sleeping on the couch when she was woken up by being hit over the head with a large blunt object. She was then tied up, blindfolded, her clothes were cut off her body with a knife, she was beaten, choked, sexually assaulted, and continuously photographed through the whole thing for two and a half hours. When she asked if he was going to kill her, the male intruder replied back with, no need for that. And with that reply, she thought she recognized his voice, but she couldn't pinpoint it. Before he left, he also took some of her intimates with him. Now, unlike the incident a few weeks prior, the OPP went door to door the next day asking the neighbors questions and if they had seen anything. They actually did this for a few days in order to make sure that they covered anyone that had been missed on the previous days, maybe at work or whatever the reason. They actually never got to speak to one resident though. The neighbor of the home had informed the police that the man living there was in the military and so his schedule was really crazy and so the police didn't really stick around to interview him. The suspicion at this point was that it was one guy doing all of these burglaries of the intimates and the sexual assaults. Although the neighborhood only did know about Lori's, not the other one. And with this in mind, people started to become on edge. 
In mid-November of 2009, at a farmhouse between Tweed and Belleville, late in the afternoon, a lovely lady named Anne was arriving home. It was her birthday, and she was just coming home to get ready to head back out, so she was really excited and in a great mood. She ran up to her bedroom to go get changed, and she was just so excited to head on out and enjoy the rest of her birthday. She opened the door to her bedroom and happily walked in and towards her dresser that had her clothes in it. But then she suddenly noticed that the night table drawers next to her bed were opened. She walked over and was shocked to see that her sex toys had been stolen. As she debated calling the police, her neighbor Howard had shown up to drive her to her party. She told him what had happened and as they talked it over and trying to rationalize what the heck was going on, they decided against reporting it to the police because, well, like, honestly, no one really wants to call the police and say, hi, yes, I would like to report a robbery. Um, yes, all my dildos were stolen. Like, unless it's a very serious operator, you might just get laughed at. And they themselves laughed it off. Like, who the heck steals dildos? Like, honestly. But Howard told Anne it was best if she didn't stay at the house that night anyways. And so they went around to all the windows, doors, and even the cars to make sure everything was locked. And Anne packed a bag. They deadbolted the kitchen door from the inside, then left the house out the front, making sure that that door was locked as well. Then they left for the rest of the evening and night to try and forget about this creepy incident and to try and enjoy the rest of Anne's birthday. The next morning, Howard drove Anne back home so that she could photocopy something quickly before she headed into work. She went up the stairs and barely stepped into her office when she let out a terrifying scream. Howard ran up to the office as quickly as possible and found Anne standing in the doorway to the office, shaking in fear. Unable to even speak, she pointed to the computer screen across the room. That's when he noticed that the computer in the corner of the room that was barely ever used was turned on and there was a message written on a Word doc up for them on the screen to read. It read, go ahead, call the police. I want to show the judge your really big dildos. Breaking her shaking and frozen stance, she ran to her bedroom and seeing her dresser drawers were cracked open. She terrifyingly opened the slightly open drawer and screamed to find it empty. She turned open the other and that's when she just completely broke down and couldn't control herself anymore. All of her intimates were gone. The kitchen door deadbolt that they had made sure was locked from the inside when they left was now unlocked. Obviously, this was the way the intruder left after writing that message on her computer screen and sealing her intimates. Realizing that the night before the intruder had must have still been in the house when they were there and they left, this was the most terrifying thing she had ever experienced. Having the thoughts of what could have happened racing through her mind if she would have stayed at that house that night with the intruder hiding somewhere in the home just waiting for his opportunity. Anne and Howard had a strong feeling that this whole incident was connected to the sexual assault and the B&Es in Tweed and because their home fell within the Belleville Police jurisdiction, the Belleville Police were in charge of the case instead of the OPP who was in charge of Tweed. Having that strong feeling that it was connected, they asked the Belleville Police if they believed that it was connected as well. And the Belleville Police replied back with, why? What's going on in Tweed? Making it known that the police forces had little to no knowledge as to what was going on in the surrounding areas that were being monitored by the OPP. And just a side note that no one in Tweed or Belleville knew about the burglaries that were going on in Ottawa since it is farther distance away. It's like a two and a half hour difference or something like that. And it is also a different police jurisdiction. When they learned that there was no communication between Belleville Police and the OPP, they took it upon themselves to spread the word of what had happened and what was happening. There was a serial offender in the area and was looking to offend again. And on top of all that, it seemed like he liked to return to the scene of the crimes. They told their friends, families, and neighbors. Along with that, Anne actually worked at the Trenton Air Force Base. And so she spread the word to the females on the base as well, stressing to make sure that they lock their doors and windows to be extra cautious. And just another side note, all of these little areas are actually 
all within like about a half hour of each other besides Ottawa, which is almost three hours away. So it's not as if it was across the whole province that these incidents were happening. It was kind of relatively all in the same area, like I guess in a three hour distance. Here's a map. Since 2007, with the burglaries of women's and girls' intimates starting off in the suburbs of Orleans in Ottawa, to those same incidents spreading to Tweed and then escalating to sexual assaults, and now this one in the Belleville area, the police needed to do something quick before another incident happened. But before they could even implement any plans, their worst fears came true. Marie-France Camot was a beautiful 37-year-old military woman who came from a military family. Her dad was a soldier for 42 years and his dad was a decorated Spitfire pilot who had served in the Second World War. She was born in Quebec on March 19, 1972, but since her father was military, she got to travel the world moving to the different bases that he would get stationed at. Admiring her father and wanting to follow in his footsteps, Marie France joined the Air Force when she was 26 years old and was stationed at bases all across Canada and in Afghanistan. Even though Marie France was in the military, she had an amazing upbeat personality and was a free spirit and an artist. She was said to be in love with life and she was curious and wanted to discover the world and try all the different foods that the earth had to offer. And so when the opportunity to become a military flight attendant came up in 2009, she jumped on that position. It was the perfect fit for Marie France's life-loving personality. This position was a dream come true. She got to travel around the world just like she always wanted. Her job was also a pretty cool one. She was specifically a flight attendant for CFE Trenton's 437 Transport Squadron, and she was working on VIP flights, meaning she got to travel with important people like the Prime Minister. Late November 2009, she was assigned to go on a trip with Prime Minister Stephen Harper on a three-day trip to India. At this time in her life, she was living alone in a bungalow-style home in Brighton, Ontario, not far from the Trenton base where she worked. When she arrived back home from her trip, she noticed that her underwear looked like it had been messed with. She accused her new boyfriend of going in there, but he adamantly denied it. She forgot about the whole weird incident and just went on with the rest of her week. Eight days later though, between 10.30 and 11 p.m. on November 24th, 2009, Marie France was on the phone for a while just chatting away. At around 12, she got off the phone and started getting ready for bed by doing her regular nightly routine. When she was ready to hop into bed, she noticed she didn't see one of her cats around, and so she went and searched for it. She walked around the main level of the house trying to find her cat, but when she noticed that she couldn't find him up there, she headed down to the basement. She was happy to see that her cat was down in the basement and hadn't gotten out somehow. It was November in Canada after all. The cat was standing in the corner of the room looking behind the furnace. She called for the cat a few times from the top of the stairs, but the cat just wouldn't come. Marie France walked down the stairs and across the basement towards the furnace to see what her cat was staring at. As she walked closer to see what her cat was so fixated on, it became clear. There was an intruder hiding right behind the furnace. She yelled, you bastard, to the intruder, but the man wasted no time and smashed her over the head multiple times with a red metal flashlight. She was bleeding heavily, but this didn't knock her unconscious, and she screamed for help and fought for her life to break away. The man was large and prepared with a duffel bag. Terrified to find out what was in that bag, Marie was not going to go down without a fight. Trying to fight every move he made, a struggle broke out across the floor. The man finally managed to get duct tape over her mouth and tied her up to the jack post in the basement. When she was bound to the post, he took two photos of her with just her shawl covering her body. While she was still tied up in the basement, he went back upstairs and grabbed a bedsheet and two kitchen knives. Then he went to her bedroom and placed the bedsheet over the already closed blinds 
and stabbed the kitchen knives through either side to hold the bed sheet up to the wall. He then walked around the house removing any night lights, leaving them just tossed on the floor. Satisfied that he had taken some safety measures, he went back to the basement to get Marie France. He tried to bring her upstairs, but once again, she did not go without a fight and made it as difficult as she possibly could for him. At some point while heading up the stairs, Marie France did fall unconscious. Whether it was from the blows to the head, bleeding continuously, or from whatever caused the big dent in the drywall at the base of the stairs, we will never know. The intruder got her upstairs and into her bedroom where he proceeded to take more photos of her. And then over the next four and a half hours, he repeatedly beat, choked, and brutally raped her all while filming and photographing it. And over those four and a half hours, Marie France continuously pleaded with him to let her live repeating that she wanted to live and that she had been a good person all her life. She tried to break away from him at every chance she got. At one point, she managed to roll off the bed and ran across the room to the bathroom with a fight breaking out in there and leaving pictures smashed. Have a heart. I've been good all my life. I don't want to die. She begged of him as she cowered in the corner of her bedroom, but he coldly replied back with, shut up and then taped her nostrils and her mouth shut with duct tape and then watched as she suffocated to death. After he was confident that she had passed, he took the duct tape off her and untied the rope that was used to bound her, picked her up off the floor and put her into her bed. He then took a clean duvet and threw it over her lifeless body. Then he took the tainted bed sheets and threw them in the washing machine along with a bunch of bleach started the cycle and then took some of her underwear and left out the back patio door into the night. That same day on November 25th, Marie France was nowhere to be found and no one had heard from her. Worried about her, her boyfriend, who was also a soldier at the Trenton base, had went to her home to check up on her. Marie France's neighbors watched as police cars surrounded her home and entered it. Then, moments later, they walked out with Marie France's boyfriend crying and his head hung low. Upon first glance of the scene, they actually ended up classifying her death as a suicide, but it was quickly changed to a homicide after thorough examination of the scene and her autopsy. No one could believe the news that she had been murdered. It just seemed next to impossible. She was such a good person and people just couldn't understand how this could happen. Since this took place in Brighton, Ontario, her death was not linked to the sexual assaults in Tweed or the break-ins in Ottawa, Tweed, and Belleville. With her being a soldier at the Trenton base, her murder became that much more shocking. People from the base were devastated by the news, with her commanding officer, Colonel Russell Williams, writing a letter of condolences to her family on behalf of the base. It read, Dear Mr. Camo, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the men and women of Eight Wing Trenton to express my sincere condolences on the tragic death of your daughter. Marie France was a professional, caring and compassionate woman who earned the respect of all with whom she came in contact with. She set high standards for herself and others and was devoted to the well-being of those around her. Marie France made a lasting impact in Trenton and will be sorely missed by her many friends. Please let me know whether there is anything I can do to help you during this very difficult time. You and your family are in our thoughts and prayers. With our deepest sympathy, D.R. Williams, Colonel, Wing Commander. On December 4th, 2009, Marie-France Camo was laid to rest at the National Cemetery in Ottawa at just 37 years old. The holidays came and passed without any incidents being reported on. People in the area were still on edge though, but the police had made statements saying that Marie-France Camo's death was an isolated incident and so people shouldn't be worried. On January 28, 2010, Jessica Lloyd arrived at her large home on Highway 37 by Belleville around 10.30 p.m. after having a nice night out. She texted her friend saying night night. The next day, Jessica didn't show up for work. Being concerned for her, her boss called her mother and let her know that she didn't come into work 
and she hadn't heard from her. Jessica's mother immediately called Jessica's brother, Andy, who went directly to Jessica's home. He was very confused to find she didn't seem to be at the home at all. He walked around and noticed all of her things were still there. Wallet, phone, purse, all of that. They couldn't figure out what had happened. It was immediately reported to the police that she was missing and a massive search broke out. The whole community came together to search for Jessica. Hundreds of missing persons posters were printed and handed out and put up everywhere, along with people coming in from all over to help with the search for her. The police, along with search and rescue, did a full out search for her, even breaking out a helicopter to cover the area from an aerial view. Jessica becoming a missing person did not get connected to the break-ins, robberies, sexual assaults, or the murder of Marie France Kamal at this time. As far as they were aware, she was another isolated incident of a person going missing. Now, I know this may sound pretty surprising, but Ontario actually does have an extremely high crime rate. Uh, Ontario does claim the spot for highest amount of homicides along with a bunch of other crimes. And so just coming from the police perspective and just playing devil's advocate, there would have needed to be something pretty significant um, in order for them to connect this missing person's case to any of the other cases or just to connect the other cases together in general. Just looking at the statistics of the amount of homicides that were going on at that time, it's pretty understandable just from that perspective alone. And so these were not the only burglaries, missing people, or homicides that they were investigating. That's just the reality of the crime in Ontario. Now, since Jessica lived right on the highway, a lot of trucks and travelers would pass by her home. One of those truck drivers was on a regular run with his cousin headed down that highway the night of Jessica's disappearance. As they were driving down the highway during that full moon night around 3 a.m., the passenger was keeping his eye out, just looking for animals and such, when he noticed that there was an SUV parked in a field a little distance away from the road and from the next house. Noting how it was a really weird spot for an SUV to be parked, especially at that time of year. I just got a shiver down my spine, said the driver as they passed the mysterious SUV. Yeah, so did I, the passenger said. They couldn't shake this eerie feeling that something was wrong with whatever they just saw. But not knowing what it was, they kept driving and went on with their day. On their drive back just a couple days later, that's when they noticed the missing persons posters of Jessica all over town. Then they drove past the same spot the SUV was. The SUV was gone from the field, but the home closest to the field was surrounded with police officers. And that's when it hit them. That SUV might be connected to the disappearance of Jessica. They went to the police telling them what they had seen just a few nights prior. Since it had not snowed, the police went back to the exact location that the two men had said they seen the SUV parked. And to their surprise, there was perfect tire indentations still in the snow. Luckily, the weather hadn't changed and the tracks were still absolutely perfect. They took the tire prints and ran them through their database to find the exact match and make and model of the tires. Once they had this, they set up roadblocks on Highway 37 in order to check anyone's tires that passed by. Thursday, February 4th, exactly a week after Jessica went missing, an SUV rolled up to the roadblock. Its tires were checked and then it was sent on its way. From that moment on, that SUV had police surveillance. On Sunday, February 7th, the OPP called the owner of the SUV and asked if he would come to the Ottawa Police Department just to answer a few questions. This man replied with, sure, no problem. Thinking the questioning was going to be about his neighbor back in Tweed, who seemed to be getting the fingers pointed at him for the creepy occurrences that were going on back there. But what he was soon about to learn would change the rest of his life along with shock the rest of Canada. And that's where I'm gonna leave part one for today. Um, part two will be up tomorrow. I won't be got making you guys wait very long. Um, so yeah, I will see you guys tomorrow. Stay safe.